what is important and what should be the most important thing, it's not what I accumulate, material stuff that I accumulate, it's not the education that I get, it's not the job that I, I, I am able to get, and it's not the money that I'm able to make and the things that I accumulate in this life. Because you see, you came in without it, and you're gonna leave without it. Even if you accumulate it, you're gonna leave without it. What is, what is the most important thing then? If life is not about me coming and getting all the stuff that I can get, four door garage house, you know, and all the different name brand cars, and to show off that I did it my way. But when I die, and it's, you, 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 it's, that is something that we cannot escape. When I die, I can't take it with me. The scripture tells us, naked we came, naked we returned. So what is the purpose of life, really? What is the purpose of life? So I pray that as we take the time to watch and listen, that this will be another moment, another day of divine transformation taking place in our lives as the people of God, as the church, and how we are meant to represent who Christ is in time on the earth, that that will become more true, more real, to the point where it's impossible for your life to ever go back to be what it was previously. The concept, the idea that the scripture gives us is that of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, metamorphosis, metamorpho. And so the scripture tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the very renewing of the mind. And when the mind is renewed, what is the state of that mind that is renewed? What does that mind look like? What is the thought process of that mind? And how does it impact my life being in Christ? I am going to remind you of something that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us about. Not everybody is hearing, but I believe even one person is hearing. And it's in regards to faith. I started out with Luke chapter 18, as Jesus gave the parable, and the parable was meant to bring us into this truth, into this understanding, that it is important for us to pray and not to faint, not to lose heart. And the, the, the part of that reading that always troubles me, if I may use that word for lack of a better word at this time, is verse 8. Jesus in that ch chapter talks about his return. And he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Many of us take that very lightly. There are people who, even, who is in this room right now sitting in front of me, they are not in the faith. They have, they're, in the first place, they were never in the faith. They have deceived themselves to think that they are, and they are not. And they are those who had a taste of it, and for various reasons of Satan workings, they have lost the faith. And they have convinced themselves that they're still okay. Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Faith is vitally important. Therefore, the scripture tells us this. And I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, you don't have to necessarily turn there with me, but I'm going to say what the Spirit would have me to say, and he who has and hears to hear will certainly hear it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through to 6, this will be the third time I am coming to you, Corinthians. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretold, foretell, as if I were present the second time. And now, being absent, I write to those who have sinned, to those who have sinned, 
before and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare, since you seek a proof of Christ. Since you seek a proof of Christ, speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Verse 5, verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Examine yourselves. Because if Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? How would one be assured that whether my body expire or whether it continue until the very return of the Lord? Because there are some of us who will experience that. We shall not all sleep. We will not all die. There are those of us that will be alive when the Lord return. How would I know that if my body expire and in the very moment of me dying, because when you're a born again person, when you're a child of God and your time of death is near, if that is within the will of God, you will know. How will I know that I would have died in the faith? How would I know? And if I live to see the return of the Lord, how would I know that when he comes in the moment of hearing the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel, how would I know that I'm in the faith? As a matter of fact, if you're not in the faith, you would have never heard the trumpet. You will never hear it. Because if you're not in the faith, it means that you are cut off from God. Because the trumpet that will be sound, it's not for the world. It's for the believers. So the world will not hear it. They're going to continue business as usual. So if I am not in the faith, I will never hear it. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you so it means then that if Jesus Christ is in you your life is supposed to be a certain way a certain way a certain way I see a level of hypocrisy in the church for over 37 years. I remember in 2022, last year, when that whole thing happened where Kem is concerned. I'm not afraid of nobody. Because this is my experience, this is my testimony. Bring me to court and lock me up. I will still talk about it. Send me home to Jamaica if you can. If you have that power, I will still talk about it. I will talk about it until God say otherwise. Because it's my experience and my testimony with wicked people. I remember when the whole thing was transpired. One of the leading person in it was talking about Christ, you know. When we had the meeting of, oh, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. You're in Christ and treat me the way that you treat me? Would Christ treat me like that? Not even those who crucify him. He didn't treat them like that. He, you know what he asked the father to do? Forgive, forgive them. Forgive them. He said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And you're going to talk about that you're in Christ and treat me the way that you treat me. Do the things and continue to do the things that you're doing. You are deceiving yourself. You are deceiving. Deeply deceived, and you need to come out of that deception if you can. When Christ is in you, your life takes on a certain, you, you think a certain way. The question is, 
what is that thinking? What does it look like? How does it affect my life? You think a certain way. You speak a certain way. You live a certain way. What does that look like? We're talking about Christ. The perfect example of how Christ is supposed to affect your life and live through you is Jesus. Let me say that again. The perfect example of how Christ is supposed to affect your life and live through you is Jesus. Jesus was 100% human. And everything that you and I as a human being will encounter in this life, temptations and whatever, Jesus faced it. But he allowed the Christ in him. He allowed the Christ in him to live out himself. Notice, let me read verse 5 again. And I'll stop and we'll continue our reading in the book of Luke. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. And, and, and the, 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 the question, if you're thinking, why is the faith connected to Christ? Why is Christ connected to the faith? Notice in the note, test yourselves it says, examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? You see the connection? The faith is connected to Christ. Christ is connected to faith. Why? The church in Corinth at the time when Paul was writing to them. And at this time, Paul was in Rome. He was arrested from Jerusalem, those of you who read the journey of his life in the book of Acts, and after he was arrested in Jerusalem, one of the Roman centurion who saw certain things that was happening, and they, the, the scripture said they were like they were actually going to tear him up in pieces. And when he saw what was happening, he sent his soldiers and demanded that they hand him over to them. God used that process to save Paul that day from the Jewish mob. And after he was taken by the Romans, you notice in the book of Acts, he went through a, a, a couple of trials. There was the trial with the high priest, which was a religious one. There was a trial with Agrippa. There was... Bernice, and there was the governor, Felix, and so forth. In the process of everything was going on, Paul, by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, requested, and he had the right to do so because he was a Roman citizen. And under Roman law, every Roman citizen had the right to go before Caesar. So he appealed to go before Caesar. They could not deny him. When, you remember even when a group heard his testimony, when Felix heard his testimony, and they heard all of it, they said there is no cause of death in this man, but he appealed to go before Caesar. We would have released him, but he appealed to go before Caesar. So to Caesar, you will go. Paul writing to the church in Corinth what you need to understand about the church, why Paul is even saying something like this to them, and it's necessary for us even today to stop and think about it. The church in Corinth had all the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating among them, but yet they were the most carnal church that you could find. Let me say that again. They had all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is the church that Paul lists in chapter 12, the gifts of the Spirit, right? Yet they were so carnal. So I can be speaking in tongues and living in sin. I can be prophesying and living in sin. I can be laying hands on the sick and see them heal. I can be casting out demons and living in sin. Interpreting tongues 
and all the gifts that you see outlined. And notice the final letter, the second letter and the final part of the letter. He said to the carnal church, examine yourselves to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? And when Jesus Christ is in you, you as an individual should know that. It's not somebody that should tell you. You should know that for because as it as it as it radiates from you to affect the life of another, you should know first and foremost that Christ lives in me. Then watch verse six. I didn't finish verse five. He says, unless he said, if you fail to examine yourself, if you're not capable of examining yourself, if you're not capable of testing yourself in the faith. And to know that Jesus Christ is in you, he says, unless you indeed are disqualified. So when you're not capable of doing that, you are disqualified. You're not in the race. Verse 6, he says, but I trust that you will know that we, the apostles, are not disqualified. I trust that you would know that as I stand in front of you as a pattern and as an example, that I'm not disqualified. And my life should give hope to those of you who are playing around that you can repent and come in alignment. Not all of you are capable of seeing me. Of seeing me. A brother... A week or two ago, made some remarks about me. And I reached out to him and I said, brother, from the time that you have been sitting in front of me, you have heard me said time and time again, ask God to show you who I am. And it is clear that you have not asked him. And even if you did, he can't show you who I am because you're not capable of seeing. Because if you saw who I am, you would not make those remarks that you have made. And again, I'm going to say to those of you that are in this room and say that I am your pastor, you need to see who your shepherd is. Because in order for you to follow me effectively, for me to lead you effectively, for me to equip you, you have got to submit yourself to the order of Christ in me. And in order for you to accurately submit yourself to it, you've got to see me as I am in Christ. Notice what Paul said to them. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. The faith and Christ living in you. I'm going to ask three persons to join me as we continue our reading in the book of Luke. Chapters 9 has um, 62 verses, so we're going to divide it in two. Um, one of you would read 31 verse, and the other read 31. And so the first person, who came up first? You did? So you'd read chapter 8, and then you read... 31 verse in chapters 9, and the other person with the other last 31 verses. I'm going to ask those of you that are watching, and those of you that are listening by radio, if you're in a position to take your Bibles, please, I ask of you to take your Bibles and follow along with the reading. This is not a joke. This is not church as usual. I know that there are people in the room right now sitting looking at me. I know that they're deeply religious. I know that they're those that are lost. But for those of you that are watching and listening, I pray, hear me and hear me well. 
Do not take the word of God lightly. Do not take the word of God lightly. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and read along with us. Go ahead, please. Luke chapter 8. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Read verse 1 again, please. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and it choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mm -hmm. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Wow. <laughs> Lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fall around among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life hmm. and bring no fruit to maturity. Read verse 14 again, please. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life hmm. mm. and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep, keep it and bear fruit with patience. With patience, yes. Wow. <laughs> now, when they, now when he has, now no one, when he has lit lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but set it on a lampstand. And those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, your mother and brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Hmm. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. As they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? <laughs> and they were afraid. Oh, wow. And marveled, saying to one another, 
Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. Then they sailed to the country of the Gardarines, which is opposite Gallery, Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for he had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him, and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Hmm. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain, so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who had fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Yes. And they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of Gardarines asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an, had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made hmm. you well. Hmm. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. Yes. Do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she <laughs> was dead. <laughs> but he put them all outside, took her by oh, the hand, Jesus. and called, saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, 
neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he per was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John, I have beheaded but who is this of whom I hear such things? Mm. So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to a, the city of Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all of these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say, that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let them deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit it? Is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And he prayed the appearance, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, mm. who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Wow. 
But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept silent and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out saying, teacher, I implore you, look on my son for he is my only child. Mm. And behold, a spirit seized him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. Wow. So I implored you, your disciples, to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless, faithless and perverse generation, wow. how, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and, and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Then, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled all, at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child, a little child, and set, by him, set him by him and said to him, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And who... And whoever receives me, and whoever receives me, receives him who sent, who me. sent me. For he is least among you, and will be, and you all will be great. Thank you. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he did not follow us. Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he, he who is not against us is on our side. <laughs> now it came to pass that when the time had come for him to be received up, he, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans 
and to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face <laughs> was set for wow. the journey of, to Jerusalem. Wow. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven to consume them? Just as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them <laughs> and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, <laughs> Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Oh. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a minute, please, especially those of you that are born again. As we take a minute and pray together. The main purpose of our gathering here in this room today is for a time of corporate fasting fasting so i'm assuming that for all the believers that are in this room you're on fasting because that's the purpose of us gathering here today and there are those who have been online with us now for a period of time that they know that today is a time of fasting so wherever they are in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Africa, and other parts of the world, they are on fasting right now, watching this. I pray that if you have been giving a procritical fast and convincing yourself that it is true, I pray that you'll repent in this moment and that our fasting will align with what Jesus Christ says in regards to us fasting in the kingdom. I pray that it will be. And I pray that if you give yourself to that, you will experience the rewards from heaven. Because the scripture tells us that when we fast the right way, our Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I pray that that will be true for somebody in this room, and for somebody that is watching, as we pray together, I don't know if you took note of the occurrence of the kingdom of God being mentioned in the two chapters that we read together. There's a whole lot of stuff that is mentioned. But if you notice, everything is within the context of the kingdom of God. And I'll remind you of one verse as we pray. Because... It's like there is not a week that pass that some point in that week the Holy Spirit would not have me thinking or seeing the truth where this is concerned. That as I teach the kingdom of God, many of us who are hearing it, we convince ourselves that we're hearing something that we had previously heard before. 
we're equating it with whatever teaching and preaching that we're hearing out there and think that I am teaching and preaching the same thing. But we need to really stop, stop if you're able to, stop, think if you're able to, and measure what you're hearing. What you're hearing from me, measure it. What you're hearing from others, measure it. The scripture commands us to do that. You don't just listen to any anybody. You measure what you hear. Now, Jesus said in verse 10 of Luke chapter 8. Just listen. And he said to them, the disciples, to you it has been given to know, not to know, to you it has been given. So once we're born again, it has been given the ability to know, it has been given. It has been given to know, but to know what? The mysteries of the kingdom of God. Do you know the mysteries of the kingdom of God? I write this every day we come inside here. Anytime we come inside here, I write this. We, we're taking this for joke. Many classify me as a cult. I pity you. Because if I'm a cult, Jesus is the cult leader. Notice what Jesus says about the parables that he was speaking. And when the disciples were concerned about it, they came to him and they asked him, why are you always speaking to the multitude in parable? He said, to you it has been given to know people. Those of you that are hearing me, God wants us to know what? The mysteries of his kingdom there is something important about you knowing the kingdom where your purpose and your destiny is concerned if you don't know it you're out of purpose and you're lost your purpose is compromised and your destiny is compromised when you don't understand the kingdom I don't I do not care what you think or say about me you can't touch me I do not have any patience for religious people, you know. I do not. Marlon, I do not. Jesus did not either. So don't look at me funny. Jesus did not put, he did not do well with the Pharisees and the scribes. And he warned his disciple about them. He said, do not, do not partake of their teaching. Avoid it. I do not have any patience for religious people. People that are bent. Watch this. Watch this. People who have convinced themselves that what they have heard, what they know, it's, 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 it's final. It's the truth. And they are not willing to change. I do not have any patience for such. He said to the to disciples and to us today, if we're able to hear it, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, it is not given. It is given in parable because it is not given to them to know. So they're going to hear the parables. They're hearing what Jesus is saying. And they think they're hearing. But they're not. In 2010, when I came here, and we started the ministry here, we took on the name Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries in Jamaica. We took on that name. Because God gave me the name in Oshawa, in a hotel room, in a fasting on a Wednesday. You came into the ministry and you're introduced to the teaching under that umbrella. 
The umbrella has been contaminated. So we change the umbrella. Because when your umbrella mash up, you dash away. <laughs> we change the umbrella and now we're under the umbrella. Kingdom living now. Minister, you think that is a joke for me? Do you think that's a joke for me? In the early 90s when God began to open my eyes because it was given to me to know. So I couldn't just continue to read the Bible as I was reading it years before. My eyes begin to open to the truth of the kingdom of God. I begin to see it. it, it as, as some of us would say, it began to jump out of the pages of the Bible. And I begin to pay attention to it. I begin to pay attention to it because it's important to God. Therefore, it should be important to us. And when the kingdom of God is not understood, purpose is compromised. I'm talking about divine purpose. I'm talking about divine destiny. You notice? Jesus went into the towns and the cities. What was he preaching? When he sent the disciples out, what did he command them? He didn't, he didn't leave them to go and prepare their sermon. He didn't give them the permission to prepare their sermon. He told them what they should preach. Go and whatever city you're going to, you're going to preach the kingdom. And any city or town or family that reject you, when you leave, you dust off the very dust. People is talking about the kingdom. When are we going to wake up? My church preacher kingdom, are they really? Are they? The preachers you're hearing on television in Canada here, the preachers that you're hearing on radio, Joy 12, something, another, are they preaching the kingdom? And a lot of, a lot of the preachers on the, the radio here and the, tel, and, the, and the television here, many of them are coming out of the United States. These persons are not representing the kingdom of God. And that's why God is taking them off the scene. Because this gospel of the kingdom, it has to preach before the Lord return. And his coming is near. So God is going to accelerate. There's going to be a divine acceleration. And you see, those of you who are sitting in front of me and think that this is a joke... If you don't stand before God righteous, you're going to regret the day your mother gave birth to you. Stop being hypocrite. If you need help, ask for help. When Christ is in you, your life is supposed to take on something that is outside of this world. Let us pray. It is given to you and I, if we are of God, to know one thing. And that is the mysteries concerning the kingdom of God. Do you know? Do you know the mysteries concerning the kingdom of God? And whatever church you say you're a part of, whichever pastor, whichever pastor you claim that you're following, are they teaching the kingdom of God? <laughs> Father, thank you for this day. Father, thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for waking us up this morning, clothing us in our right mind, allowing us to, order to see a brand new day, a day that we have never seen before and a day that we will never see again. For many people, it's just Saturday. But for us who are off you, Father, it shouldn't be just Saturday. This is the day that you have made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. And Father, there are things that this day has been permitted to host concerning the kingdom of God. May we hear it. May we see it. 
May we experience it. May we be transformed into that which we have heard and that which we have experienced. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, I pray that as we come together in this room, as we come together around our television or our computer or phones or tablets or whatever, Father, your people are choosing to watch and listen. Those who have come around their radio, I pray, Father, that it will not be another religious program. I pray that it will not be another religious message, but it will be one that is divinely, divinely, divinely released from your spirit, from heaven, from the throne room of the living God into the earth rim for us to be for us to be ushered into that which you into that which you want the church to come into in this moment the spirit the spirit your spirit is here to continue to speak to the church to continue to guide the church to continue to to allow the church to stay in alignment with truth to continue to allow the church to know that it's in the faith and that it needs to remain in the faith in order for purpose to continue to be effective and for destiny to be lived out. Father, thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. And I pray, Father, for those that have not yet experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit that this day will be the day for them. For somebody that is watching and listening, this will be the day for them to experience, to encounter that. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that your spirit will be given the freedom to speak and to continue to speak to us. That the word will take its rightful place in our lives. Because Jesus, as you explained to the disciples, but others fell on good ground, sprung up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. You said, when, when, when we hear the word and we receive it rightly, it is going to affect our lives. It's going to bring forth. 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 And we will know when the word is bringing forth because it will look like what we have heard and what we have read. Father, thank you. For this moment and this time of corporate fasting, I pray that as we take the time on purpose to fast, as we choose to abstain from food, to abstain from certain other activities and certain routines, and give ourselves to you, give ourselves to your spirit and to your word, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that this will be a moment of fast that will honor heaven. It will be a moment and a time of fasting that will honor heaven, that the Holy Spirit will have the freedom to speak and to move and to do what needs to be done. And that, Father, the reward, we will experience it. We will experience it where our spirits become more open to you. Our spirits become more sensitive to you. Our spirits become more open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We, we become more sensitive to your voice. Father... Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Father, thank you that you are the one who created the heavens and the earth, not man, no man. You created it. And you created it for a purpose. You created it for a purpose. Father, as you have placed each nation where they are and set their boundaries... They're meant to play out in your plans and purposes in the earth. Father, thank you for the prophetic destiny of each nation. Even when the nation doesn't recognize you, there is a prophetic destiny. Iran has a prophetic destiny. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. Father, all those nations in the Middle East that right now they are rebelling against you and they will kill even people if they find them with a Bible. Or, but Father, they, you're not afraid of Iran. You're not afraid of the Ayatollah. You're not afraid of the president of Iran. You're not afraid of the president of Egypt. You're not afraid of any man. You control their breath. Their breath is in your hand. The heart of the king is in your hand. Father, 
I pray that the nations, the nations, the nations, the nations, the nations will come to recognize your son. You said, Lord, that we should pray for all men, that they would know so. I pray. And Father, as we're standing in this room, there is a current conflict that is going on in the Middle East. It's brewing. Something is brewing. And Father, I pray for Israel. I pray for that land. I pray for the Arabs because, Father, you have a plan for them. Salvation is offered to them also. The majority of them have given themselves over to, to Islam. Father, I pray for the Arabs. You have made a promise to Abraham and you told him that you would not forget Ishmael. I pray, Father. And when they see Israel as an enemy, I pray that they will come to know their, the Messiah that came to Israel. Because you made a promise to Abraham. You made a promise to Abraham and there was a promised seed. And Father, I pray that Christ will be known. Those who have given themselves over to Islam, I pray that they will come to know the Christ of God. Not the Christ of the Jews, but the Christ of God. You are the Christ of God. I pray that they'll come to know you. I pray that the nations of the world will come to know you, Father. Because you're rather not the debt of a sinner, but that all should repent. And come to the knowledge of your son. So, Father, we pray that. And, Father, where this conflict is concerned... And since it started, Lord, and I've been asking you, how should I pray for Israel even at this time? Because, Father, there are certain things that you have already purposed that it has to come to pass. It has to come to pass. And we want to know that we are praying in alignment with your purpose. So, Father, I say today, let your will be done where Israel is concerned. Let your will be done. Your will and your will alone. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit and the Word will have the freedom to minister to your people. Continue to grant strength and comfort and peace. I thank you, Father, for who you are. I thank you for who you are. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you can, please. Wow. I am going to leave anything else that is not really relevant for this moment. I'm going to leave it until tomorrow. I want to go into the word, and if you will allow the spirit in me to usher you into a certain season that has come upon the church, but the church has not realized it. So it's good to be here. It's good to see those of you that are here and those of you that are joining us online. For the last couple of months or so, I've been talking about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. I'm not finished with it. And the reason why I'm not finished with it is that the Holy Spirit is not finished with it. But I want to interject something into the mix of talking about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit today. And this is what I want to talk about. Tomorrow I will resume talking about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. And we're dealing with the Spirit of God, 
we went through looking at the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. What does that look like? And we have been looking at the Spirit of God in the New Testament. I don't know if you get any inclination yet what it looks like in the New Testament. Times and seasons in God. Did you write it down? Times and seasons in God. The first scripture that I want to start with, if I may use this as a foundation, is Acts chapter 1. Times and seasons in God. Times and seasons in God. Acts chapter 1, and let us read the first eight verses of this chapter. The former account I made, O Theophilus. For those of us who are acquainted with the Bible, we know that the former account is Luke. He said, the former account I made, O Theophilus, and notice what understanding that the former account brought him into of all that Jesus begun both to do and teach. Notice he did not say of all that Jesus begun and end. Of all that Jesus begun both to do and teach. And watch this. Until, until the day in which he, Jesus, was taken up after, was taken up into heaven. And we know in, in this very chapter, it, it, it shows us what that looks like, what happened then. It says, until he was taken up, after he was taken up, he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, has given commandments to who? The apostles, I want you to pay attention to that. The apostles whom he had chosen, to whom the apostles he also showed, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Being seen by them, the apostles, during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining what? So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that we're taking for granted, the kingdom of God that we're rebelling against, that we're refusing, that we're taking it and think that we can turn it into religion and escape. There is a judgment that you activate when you hear it and refuse to receive it. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What should preachers be preaching that are sent by God? Verse 4, and being, and Jesus being assembled together with them, the apostles, he commanded them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, which he the Father said, you have heard, and you have heard, have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I pray that I'm prophesying that to somebody. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this 
time, underline, circle, highlight the word time, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, pay attention more closely to verse 7. And he, Jesus, said to them, it is not for you to know, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But he was not saying that they would never know the times and the seasons. But notice the context in which he said what he said in verse 6. What did they ask? What did they ask? They asked if he would at this time, this time, what, what time was it when they asked that? What, they, what were they thinking? Do you think that they were thinking about time as in clock? Will you at this time? Because before, they thought he would have done it. And he didn't. And they crucified him. He died. You remember when the, the two, two of the disciples were on their way to Emmaus after the resurrection of Jesus? What were their discussion? What were, we thought that he would be the one to redeem Israel <laughs> and to restore the kingdom of David. And Jesus, the scripture said, appeared in the midst of them and joined the conversation. And he said, what are you talking about? They said, are you a stranger? And, didn't, and you don't know what happened three days ago, how they crucified Jesus, and so on and so on. And Jesus began to break down certain things. They didn't get it until long after. So at this moment, now they're saying, at this time, now that, you, now that you have died and you rose again from the dead, and all of this is, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? What was in the mind of many of the Jewish people why they rejected Jesus? They knew that a Messiah was coming, a Christ, a king was coming. They knew the prophecies. Come on, even when, when the wise men went into Herod in the, into the palace and asked, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Note, Herod sent and called who? Remember? He sent and called from Israel men who knew the prophecy. And he said, tell me, where, where, where should this happen? And they said, oh, in Bethlehem of Judea, according to the prophecy, this would happen. So when he heard that this prophecy had now come to pass, remember, he sent out his men to kill the boy babies two years and under. They knew the prophecies. They believe it. But the one who showed up saying he was the Christ, and furthermore, what they were, watch this, what they were expecting him to do, he did not do it. Like many of you are expecting me to do certain things. Why some of you turn against me and hate me? Some of you say me don't have no vision. Because you are expecting me to come here and do like what other people are doing. You know what God told me when I was coming here the very first time in 2001? That you're not going on a vacation. I was excited. Wow, I had heard about Canada. And what I heard about Canada is that it's cold. And that turned off Jamaicans from wanting to come here. And when we got the understanding that this door is open, God says, you're not going on a vacation, you're going on an assignment. Which I never took my travels or wherever I'm going lightly because I know that as a person of God, everything that I do, wherever I am, wherever I go, I must be open to represent 
God. But God wanted to emphasize, he wanted to highlight, he wanted me to come into this full awareness that Canada is a country that before you were formed in your mother's womb, I purpose you to be there. That though you would have been born, think about it, why God didn't allow me to be born in Canada? Why wasn't I born in Canada? Born to some person here. Why? It could have happened. But he allowed me to be born in Jamaica. Jamaica was the place that he would transit. I would transit through to come here. I didn't come to Canada like many people who have migrated from different countries because of a better life. When you're in the kingdom of God, no place can offer you a better life. Let me say that again. When you're in the kingdom of God, no place can offer you a better life. Your life is already defined by the kingdom of God. So when you go into a place, it's the kingdom of God that must dictate your life in that place. Because those who are fighting to get rid of me out of Canada, they think, they are convinced that if they get me to leave Canada, I'm going to suffer. I am not going to have anything. I'm going to be naked. I'm going to be hungry. I'm going to walk on the street in Jamaica as a beggar. And shake, you know, and say, pity the poor. <laughs> you need to know Christ. When a person is in the kingdom, it's not a country that de determines their prosperity or their blessing. It's the king. So I can be in hell and prosper. When Israel was in Egypt and the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died... And a new Pharaoh came to the throne. He looked at Israel and he says, if we leave these people as they are, the possibility is that when an enemy come against us, they may join with them because they are many. Let us control them. And he didn't know that he was actually fulfilling prophecy. But I don't want to show you in that. The Bible says, the Bible says, it's there, we read it, that the more they afflicted them. So even in hell, I am going to prosper. I am going to succeed. No man can stop me from prospering. None. Many of them want to go on like them control me and they own me and I must kiss their foot. And I come talk about I'm ungrateful. Because I don't worship you. I worship only God. You should be honored that you cross path with me. You should be honored that God allow you to have the privilege of helping me based on what I am carrying. But the thing is, you don't know who I am. You think I'm just a man from Jamaica. John, a man sent from God. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light that should come into the world. That all men through him might believe. What is God doing through me? Causing many of you to come into an understanding. To come into a revelation. And it's only those of you that can see who I am. He was sent to bear witness unto that light. That all men through him. Second thing God did 
after the door to Canada was open. And I never came to Canada up until this very day. I never came to Canada thinking about money. I never came to Canada thinking about what I can accumulate until this day. I don't care whether you want to believe me or not. God is my witness. A second thing that God said to me for you to understand the seriousness of my assignment. While many of you don't think that I have an assignment, I don't have no vision. I, 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 because many of them that are, that are saying that I don't have any vision, over the 13 years that we have been here, we should have a lot of churches. Because you see what they're thinking about. <laughs> Imagine if I had in Ontario alone, imagine if I had about 10 of those ministries, you know. And then in, in, in the way in which ministries are operating today, what we would do under that kind of a system, you would put even people that are not called to be pastors. Put one in Brampton, put one in Mississauga, put one in, in, in Kitchener, put one in Burlington, put, and you know, and man, millions coming in. In a matter of about two, two three years, I would have my own private jet park up at Pearson. <laughs> and Kingsley would be my head bodyguard. <laughs> And when I'm traveling, man, you know, I'm, I have an entourage. Don't have any vision. Don't have any vision. Don't have any vision. How can God send you and you don't have no vision? Unless you step out of what he send you to do. When you come to talk about I don't have any vision, you need to sit down with me and ask me, what did God told you? What did God showed you when he sent you here? Did Jesus have a vision? <laughs> did Jesus have a vision? What was the vision? How come he didn't build nothing? In, in <laughs> All he was doing, just walking around and preach. Every day. From city to city. Him no build no tabernacle, him no build no building, him no build no house, him just to walk up and have some man fall back at him. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Didn't have any vision. According to your estimation, he didn't have no vision, right? That's why they also crucified him. Because we're expecting our Messiah to come overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel. He doesn't have a vision. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if you can hear me today, there is something that is way bigger than having a house. There is something that is way bigger than having a car. There is something that is way bigger than having clothes. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. How do we come into that? And to be honest with you, even though I don't like to use that term, because I'm always honest, I don't need to say it. When I came here the first time, Sister Carty, I never expect to even come back again. Hear me and hear me well today. Because, hear this now. I think I'd, I'd mentioned this. The sister in Florida, she came here a couple months ago. I hadn't seen her in how many years, like maybe 15 years or so. We hadn't seen each other. And she, when she met me in Jamaica, after I got born again and she came on vacation, she worked as, as a nurse in Florida, Jackson Memorial Hospital, for years until she retired. When she came to Jamaica and met me after I got born again, there was this 
divine connection. And so she sent me first as a single person. I think she sent me about two or three invitations to come to the United States. They turned me down at the embassy. At that time, the embassy was on Oxford Road in Kingston. They moved it after. <laughs> Then after I got married, she sent me because when I went in as a single, they said I don't have enough ties. I, I agree with them at that time. I had about maybe two ties, you know, that I had. I didn't have a lot of ties. And they, one of the ties, you know, they said they're looking for if you're married, if you have land and stuff like that. Don't have that. I got married and she sent a couple other invitations. And again, we went as a couple, wife and husband two, three times, four times or whatever, and we were denied. So it eventually about eight times I went to the U.S. Embassy. And it didn't happen. Anybody hearing me today? Because God did not purpose me to be in the United States. I don't know. I might, I might travel there. I might. Right now I'm preaching there. I am preaching there. Where I, this ministry is impacting a lot of people in the United States. But I might go there physically someday to preach or whatever. But for now, in this season of my life, God would have me to be in Canada. What was it that God told me? What was it that God showed me? And that when I came here, I could not follow prior police. I could not follow kingdom covenant church or covenant kingdom church or whatever ministry they have. I, I, God never sent me here to mimic or copy Rhema. God never sent me here to mimic our copy revival time. God never sent me here to mimic our copy Kennedy Road Tabernacle. What is, what is the vision? Because many of you that are saying that I don't have a vision, you are looking at other people and using their measurement to measure me. And when God sent a man, you don't use another man to measure the man. You use the God that sent him. And that's why if you're baptized by John the Baptist and you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be rebaptized. Because when God told me to come here, he knew that they were already here. What were they doing and still doing today? And he said, you're going to go and you're not going to follow them. You're going to now restore my divine context and order. Who can see it will see it. Who can't, they won't. And he didn't send me here to build Churches as in building to get a whole heap of people to come so that a lot of money can flow in. He didn't send me to do that. If he did, I, what? You know I have the potential. You know I can. Yeah. But I was warned by God long before you knew me, long before... I knew that I would be in this position today. In Jamaica, the Lord said to me, he said, the day you compromised my word and compromised what I have assigned you to do, I will lift the anointing off your life. And if the anointing is lift off your life, you are naked. You are dead. Remember Saul? King Saul. How did his life end 
after the anointing was lifted off his life. He fell on his own sword. He committed suicide. So with that, I want you to hear me now. How many of you in this room that God has assigned me to you and assigned you to me? How many? I know not all of you. Some of you in this room, you're spies. You're here to spy from Chem, and you're here to spy from that other place. And I don't have to call the name because you know. Some of you in this room right now, you are spies. And you're not going to stop me from dispensing the word today. Because in the midst of the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus Christ continued to teach and preach the kingdom of God. And that's why he says, he who has an ears to hear, let him hear. There were always spies around Jesus. Seeking to trap him by his word. So come online and watch and listen to find words to use against me. I am not afraid because the same thing happened to Jesus. The same thing happened to the apostles. And they were not afraid. Beat me, lock me up, put me in prison. It will not stop me from fulfilling my assignment. Not even death did not stop Jesus. I said not even death did not stop Jesus. One songwriter said, even in the grave, he is Lord. We need to know who Christ is in us. You fear no man, you fear nothing. They can't threaten you with nothing and you're afraid. They can't threaten you with food. They can't threaten you with nothing. What shall separate? What? Life, present, things to come, things will not come yet. Principalities, powers, nakedness, famine, name it. In verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you, will you at this time? So, so what did they recognize about him that they would ask him even such a question? That he had the power to do it. <laughs> Who is he in the first place? That they would make such a request of him. Will you at this time restore, restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus knew that at that time he was not here to restore the kingdom of Israel. He was here to restore the kingdom of God. Israel was meant to be a representation of the kingdom of God. But Israel is not the kingdom of God. As the church is not the kingdom of God. The church is meant to be governed by the kingdom of God. But the church is not the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not the church. The church is meant to operate within the kingdom of God, as Israel was. So they, they got it wrong. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And as I said, if you pay attention here, He's not saying that they would know times and seasons. How would it happen? But you shall receive. What does power in the spirit look like? Do you know that when we talk about the power of God in church today, today, present church, one thing comes to people's mind, casting out demons, speaking in tongues and 
prophesying and doing those things. That's, that's the power of God. The power of God is bigger than that. The first and foremost thing that you need to understand about the power of God is that it is meant to transform your life. Because if you're going to put that power on display, you should first be the power. Your life is supposed to be in alignment with that power. That before people see a demonstration of the power, they're seeing the power in living color, if you may. Living out. And many of us want to display power and there's no character. There is no integrity. There is no righteousness. There is no holiness. So when Jesus said this to them, that you shall receive power, you shall receive an ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Not just about speaking in tongues. Because notice, what, notice the answer. Jesus gave that. Jesus made that statement based on the question that they asked. What was the question again? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the season that the Father has kept in his authority, reserving his power. But you will know. You will know what the Father is doing when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the Holy Spirit being upon you. They are those moments where you are pulling. You are receiving. And you are receiving to come into. It says. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses. One of the working of the Spirit in our life is to, watch this, watch this, you shall be witnesses. One of the working of the Spirit in our life is to, you shall be witnesses. One of the working of the Spirit in our life is to, you shall be, notice, you shall be. You're not going to do witness. You're not going to go out and hand out tracks and pamphlets. You're not going to be a Jehovah's witness. You shall be witnesses. You shall be witnesses to, notice, to me. Do you know what that means? You shall be witnesses to me. Examine yourself. Do you know that Christ is in you? You shall be witnesses to me. Right now, when people see you, who are you? Who are you giving witness to? When people experience you, when people encounter you, who are you giving witness to? People should know that there is something different, unique about you before they know that you go to church, as they call it. <laughs> Some people come inside and they say, she? She Christian? He? He? He Christian? Hear this. I remember time and time again, it happened. And when persons realized, they said, oh, that's why he's like that. I d if you notice, I never wear, I do not wear any clothing that said God, Jesus, Jesus loves me. I don't have no symbol on my vehicle. I don't like it because my life must speak loud. The idea of Christianity, especially in the Caribbean, people wear Christianity on their outside. The hair, the hat, 
There are some churches you, as a woman, you cannot process your years. So we, we, we identify the Christian and say, look, look, at, look, at, she's a Christian. How? Look at her here. And, and there's Christian plat. <laughs> the dress. You're not supposed to wear Christ in your clothing, and you can't. Dress appropriately, yes, but that's not what should define you. That's what defines the Muslim. That's what defines the Sikh. That's what defines the Hindu. That's what defines religious people. The moment you see them. That should not be the case where we're concerned in Christ. There must be something bigger than your clothes. You have Indians, right? East Indians that are a part of different religious factions. In India alone, how do you know? Because you're looking at Indian, how do you know? How do you know the Indian that is a Sikh? How do you know the Indian that is a Muslim? How do you know the Indian that is a Buddhist? The way how they dress. And for years, I saw people dressing a certain way. And they were the devil in long skirt. They were the devil in turtleneck. Long sleeve. You never see any part of their body. But they were wicked. And still is up until today. They know nothing about God. They know nothing about the kingdom. But they convince themselves that they do. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon, upon, because once you're born again, he's already in you. Once you're born again, he's already with you. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Many of you sit in here and you hear the teaching. When you leave here, what is your desire? Even inside here right now, do you have a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because that's the problem with us. That's the problem with us. The Holy Spirit is missing. We're making decisions without the Holy Spirit. We are, watch this, we are trying, we are trying to please God without the Holy Spirit. Notice I emphasize we are trying because without the Holy Spirit, anything you're doing towards God, I try, you are try. You are trying to live holy. How long you think that's going to last? You find yourself in a man's bed and you're not married to him. You find yourself in a woman's bed and you're not married to her, to her, sir. Trying to live without the Holy Spirit, you will never be free from loss. You're lusting after every woman where you see. You're lusting after every man where you see. And you're doing everything. Trying to serve God without the Holy Spirit. It's an impossible, impossible fleet. But when the Spirit... When you receive the Holy Spirit, it is 100% possible for you to be holy, for you to be righteous, for you to live exactly like Jesus. You are not trying. I am not trying to be holy. That's religion. I remember so many people I would meet in Jamaica, and when you say, Hi, sis, how are you? I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying, and they die trying. You're not in a science lab trying something. You're in the kingdom of God. It was established before the foundations of the world. So you're not here to try it. It is that which creates the heavens and the earth and everything that is to be. So when you enter it and submit yourself, everything is a must. 
everything is a must. I'm not here to try anything. It has already been, it has, it has already been tried, tested, and proven. So, you notice? Some of us are trying to be healed. Trying to be healed. Receive your healing. When I say that, some of you say, oh, I receive my healing, pastor. Here it is. I receive my healing. You said it, and then you defeat yourself. Notice the next words that come out of your mouth. But I am waiting for the manifestation. If you receive it, you now wait for the manifestation. You notice how you defeat yourself? I receive my healing, Pastor, but I'm but. The moment you put a but in there, you change something. It's no longer fate. There is no but in fate. Now faith is the substance of things all for. And it is the very evidence of the things that you don't see with your natural eyes. But you know that it exists because of the spirit of God in you. The words you speak tells on you if you're in faith. You remember Jesus heard it? Notice what the man says. Lord, you don't need to come to my house. I recognize who you are. Speak a word only. And not maybe. Perhaps. And my servant will. Will be healed. The Bible says. After he explained to Jesus why he made that statement. Because he said, I am a man also under authority. And I see this every day. I say to the soldiers under my governance, go. He doesn't say, um, ask any question. He goes. When I say to one, come, he doesn't ask any question. He comes. And when I say to my servant at home, do this, he doesn't ask any question. He does it. He says, I also am a man under authority. So you are going to speak a word. And when you speak that word, it's done. Remember, Jesus heard it. And he said, I have not found so great faith in Israel. Many of you in front of me are struggling with certain sickness, certain disease. I've I have... Months I went through the healing promises of God. I didn't even know. I never had a count until I hear somebody say it's 31 episode. It doesn't matter. It's what the Spirit is releasing in the season. And you sit there and you're still struggling. And you're telling yourself, Pastor, I receive my healing. But, wrong statement. I receive my healing. But, I am waiting for the manifestation. A package has been dispatched from somewhere. And the addressee on that package is you. There are logistics that that package is going to go through before it comes to your door. And when that package comes to your door, and some packages, it is required that you sign for it. And once that package comes to your door and you sign for it and you take that package and you go and put it down and you say, they contact you because in some cases, sometimes they reach out to find out, did you receive? Because even though it shows that it's delivered on their end, they want to confirm that you have the package in your possession. And you say, oh, I received the package, but I'm waiting <laughs> Sign for the package. You put it down one side in those. And you say, I received the package, but I'm waiting for the content. To manifest, you know, the package is going to automatically open itself. You know, because we think it's cartoon or some kind of science fiction, sci-fi movie. We are what? So the package is going to open up and... <laughs> and 
in the morning, you look, you say, who? Television. Now, when you receive it, you open it. You open it. When you receive it, it's in your possession. I shall never be sick another day in my life. Um, that's not a religious statement for me. I know what I am saying. When you understand, when you understand, when you understand how faith works, you can say that. Faith works a certain way. Faith is, faith is the substance of things all for. So the promise, the promise, the promises of God gives you what? Hope. Faith is, so faith in God is not blind faith. And hope in God is not wishful thinking. It's based on what God says. And what God says, you should know that it's already done because God cannot lie. lie. How does faith work? The word. How does it work? And, and faith and the word, they're connected, remember? Faith comes by. So don't just say it because I say it. You need to know. Because even some of us, when we do say it, we are saying it out of fear. Suppose I say, I shall never be sick another day in my life, and I, and I get sick. You're defeating yourself right there. Shut your mouth. Until you get to the place where that thought, it's not permitted. <laughs> that thought is not permitted to enter your thought process. Because you have authority to capture thoughts. You have authority to permit thoughts to flow through your mind. You're not a victim. You just sit on every thought. Just come and, and oh God, oh, I'm going to manage. No, you have authority in Christ. Capture every thought and bring it, bring it, bring it down into obedience to Christ. Every I thing, every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You, you arrest it. You lock it up. And you say, you are forbidden. You are forbidden to enter my thought process. Because you have the mind of Christ. Think on these things to show you that you have power over your thoughts. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Think on these things. Whatever things are... True, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are, wow. <laughs> if there be any virtue, <sighs> think on these things. You can choose what you think on. It's a wild west out there with information. But you can, that's why I will not read every book. I will not read any and any book. People ask me, have you ever read the book of Enoch? I don't care to read it. Some of you dabbling around with Enoch book. <laughs> There's no evidence in the scripture that Enoch wrote a book. The scripture told us that Enoch walked with God. Because you see, a lot of us are of the idea to think that people in the scripture was about writing book. Like a lot of these preachers today. And the reason why they're writing book is not because they care about building you up. It's because they care about their pocket. I will not read every book. I will not read every anybody book. There are some preachers out there. I will not even let their book cross the threshold of my house. 
Because the scripture says, anyone who does not preach this doctrine, you should not invite them into your house. So you may not invite the person physically into yours, but you go and you buy their book. If the book represents the person, you need to go home and throw out some book, kick it out of your house and lock the door, put it in the garbage. I can't believe you just said that. You stay, stay right there again and say, if me not say it again. <laughs> and rewind and say, if me not go hear it again. I didn't make a mistake. There are books that you need to throw. Joyce Meyer books. Joel Osteen books. A few years ago, I went through my book collections and I did a clean out. Throw them in the garbage. Because I, I was deceived years ago to think that they're representing Christ and the kingdom. And they are not. And after you're coming to certain truth, do not play with it. Do not allow anybody to undermine the truth that you're coming to. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're a household name. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care if CNN have them on their program how many times. CNN know which preacher to pick to come on their program. And sometimes some of the preachers, if you notice, when they come and if the preacher is saying certain things, they cut it off and say, oh, it's a technical, <laughs> it's a lie. Because the preacher is saying something that they don't agree with. They quickly cut them off and talk about technical problem. I promise you, CNN will never invite Bobby Somers to be on any of their program to talk about things concerning Christ and the Bible. They will never. Because before they invite you, them, they would go on my channel and they would watch some of the videos. And say, uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> this one is wild. We can't even tame him. Even if we lock him up for a few weeks, he's coming out the door still wild. Unless Christ says, oh, sister, unless Christ opened that door, but... I'll be outside of that. The prime minister would never invite me to pray at any of their <laughs> functions. <laughs> Go. How does it work? I believe I'm going to have a part two to this. I, 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 I kind of figured from before I even opened myself to what the Holy Spirit is saying to me here. Let me also allow you to understand why I'm sharing on this right now. So I'm going to go to another passage in Genesis. So first... I establish that they are indeed times and seasons within God. The Greeks had two concepts where time is concerned. Two concepts they have about time. And they name the two concepts. One, they call it chronos. That's where we get the word chronicle, chronological. The second, they name it kairos. Kronos Kairos This one both of them is time but it's two different measurement of time This one it's where the clock And this one is where life is concerned. 
This one, I refer to it as being what is natural. And this one, I refer to it as what is spirit. How do you measure a day, month, and years is Kronos? How do you measure your life? This governs this. And I'm going to show you something. Go to Genesis chapter 1 with me, please. The Greeks had certain you know, ideas about life in general. And when they originally talk about these things, it had nothing to do with God. It had nothing to do with Christ. I'll, I'll show you one of the ideas that is implemented by even Jesus himself and the apostles. The Greeks were the one who came up with the idea of baptism. Baptism. So the Greek word, baptizo. Know where the concept come from? The woman would dip a sponge in soapy water to clean something. And when the sponge is dipped into that soapy water, the sponge is baptized. Whatever the sponge is dipped into it, it absorbs it. I want you to think about baptism and being baptized by the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit. So when you're dipped into it, and you're taken out, you're supposed to be saturated with it. Up until yesterday evening, I washed some dishes. And when I take the sponge, and I, had, I use one of those sponge that one side of it, it has that, um, that harder part that you use to scrub the, you know, the rougher part of stuff. And then you have the soft part. And I would normally squeeze the, the, the soap. I use Dawn. So I squeeze the soap, one, two, three. Depends on the amount of plate I know. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. And once I do that, I wet the sponge before I squeeze the soap on it. And when I squeeze the soap on it, and I apply it to the plate and the cup, and when, I wa when I'm washing plate, I wash the cups first, the cups and the glass first. Then I'll wash the utensils. Then I go to the plates, and you leave the metal stuff lay for, the, for the last. Because you don't want no grease to gather up, and then you transfer the grease and the plastic. That's something I learned from wash plate at Jamaica. <laughs> Because sometimes you finish wash better when you look, you say everything oily. <laughs> so when I apply the soap and the water to the sponge, the sponge absorb it. And one of the things that I learn about the sponge, if you put the sponge in a glass of water and the sponge absorbs that water, and you squeeze out the sponge, you will never have all of the water that the sponge absorbs coming back into the glass. The sponge is going to contain some of that water. So when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and God take you up, you're supposed to be Dripping. So somebody know that you have been baptized into something. So now, that started with the Greeks. When Jesus came on the scene, when John came on the scene, the apostles came on the scene, they took the concept of the Greek this for the, for the church to understand it, that this is what is going to happen to you 
when you are dipped in God. The scripture talk about being baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3. The scripture talk about being baptized into the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The scripture talks about this being baptized into the body of Christ as individual members. So if you are baptized into the body of Christ, you're supposed to absorb what you are baptized into. The question is, who is Christ and what does Christ look like? A few Sundays ago, as I was sharing on faith, I made mention about the season being changed. On the 23rd of September this year, fall, autumn, entered into our hemisphere. Because in the southern hemisphere, they're, re they're experiencing not fall. Notice, you know, when we in the north is experiencing winter, it's summer for them. So in the northern hemisphere, it's fall. The season has changed. And I look, about, I look at it from time to time, as I said, and I know that in Jamaica, there is spring, there is summer, there is fall, and there is winter also. We talk about winter in Jamaica and people laugh. But for Jamaicans, when it comes to that time of the year, December, January, and February, you will see them in thick sweater, and, them are, them are, they, they, and then you laughing at them and say, oh, we are going with it. It's like you want to take what they set up for them. It's like, oh, come, 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 whatever. <laughs> you, you, you want to say cold and experience cold? Come with me. But for them, it's cold, right? And they experience it. But it manifests itself on, a, I would say, a milder tone than it does in the north, right? So... I look at it and I see where the weather here, that the, when, when you think about it, the seasons in Canada demands that you dress appropriately. Last week, my wife said, please, for my sake, dress. <laughs> because even last week, sometime in last week, I was out in shorts and slippers and t-shirt. And <laughs> I took her to this place and she was inside waiting for me to come back and pick her up and she was talking to the lady at the front desk and the lady was saying something about her husband. She said, my husband, he's in shorts and slippers. They say, when you're out there, don't walk beside him. <laughs> because... <laughs> but, I, but, but I said that I am not ready to put on all these clothes and because it's, it's a long, long seven months. So I'm still resisting. I'm not opposing, <laughs> but, but I'm holding on as much as I can. And throughout the weeks and so, we have some nice days in between that was still considered short and slippers. But I'm saying all of that to say this, that there is a pronounced manifestation when the season change that even if you didn't know based on calendar if you weren't listening to the radio or watching the television you see it one of the pronounced evidence in fall is what the leaves changing you go into certain place in Caledon you go into certain place in Georgian Bay and those places, and when you look out across, you say, wow. This time, I don't care how long it takes on the back roads. Highway is boring. The highway is frustrating, and it puts a lot of pressure on you. You really want to relax? Let's drive on the back road. And, and this is where you take your time. And you, you, you'll release your seat to go back a, a couple inches, degree back. And you lean and you just... And sometimes you stop. And you look. And you just... And, and, and in, the, in the back of your mind you hear, Oh Lord, my God. 
When I in awesome wonder, considering all the world thy hands have made, that a green leaf tree turn orange, a green leaf turn red, a green leaf tree turn all these colors. <laughs> Wow. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great, how great thou art. I do, I, 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 <laughs> this, this preacher man was confronted by an atheist and was challenging him about certain things. And he says, Sir, I'm not going to fight with you, but I know that the God that I believe in. He made a black cow to produce white milk that produced yellow cheese. <laughs> and the 80s eat cheese. So I want you to think about this. As I mentioned the seasons, and a sister reached out to me and said, Pastor, you said this. As I go back listening, could you explain a little more? And I felt in my spirit that I didn't only need to give her the answer, but I need to help you to transit into the season that the church has entered in. Genesis chapter 1. What I want to do in Genesis chapter 1 before I wrap up here, I want to show you where God created the natural season, the natural time and season. Which of the day that God created the heavens and the earth simultaneously? Day one, God did not create the heavens nor the earth. Day two, God did not create the heavens nor the earth yet. Day three, he did not create it yet. Remember what? First thing that God spoke into being was what? I want you to look at verse nine. Genesis chapter one. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. <laughs> and it was so. And God called, God purposed the dry land and he called it what? When he calls something, when he names something, he's purposing it. Eve was not a woman until Adam said, <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying and don't take it wrong either. If you're carnal, you're going to take it wrong. But if you're in the spirit, you will understand what I'm saying here. The dry land, he called it earth. And the gathering together of the waters, he purposes and call it what? Seas. Seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth, now that he has purposed it, he said, let the earth bring forth grass. But when did that happen? happen right an herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed whose seed is in itself on the earth and it was and it was verse 12 and the earth because god said it and the earth brought forth grass why why did it brought forth grass? Because God said it, right? And the herb that yield 
yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was evening and the morning was the third day. Now you notice how the evening and the morning is structured? What brought it about? It's not the evening and the morning come first and then God create. It's whatever God do in that moment create the evening and the morning. The third day. Then God said in verse 14, let there be so in, 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 in verse 3, when God said, let there be light, he didn't say lights. That's different from what is happening here now, right? <laughs> because the scripture talks about it later on in Corinthians, that he commanded the light to shine out of darkness, the light. Not a light. Now he says in verse 14, and God said, let there be lights, where? Of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for, not, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens, in the, in the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars all so, because Israel needed to hear this, because remember, God is giving Moses this information after Israel came out of Egypt. He made the stars also. It's important for them to understand that you do not worship the stars. He made the stars also. In Egypt, they worshiped the greater light, which was the sun god, Ra. And he also wanted them to know that I created the stars. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good verse 19 I'll stop there so the evening and the morning were the fourth day now in verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. I want you to pay attention to this, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. What kind of signs? And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. The sun and the moon and the stars are important to the natural seasons around us. Am I right? Let me show you something before I say anything. Now what I want to establish here in reading Genesis chapter 1, we see that God created the natural seasons. The natural day. There's a natural day and there's a spiritual day. There's a natural night and there's a spiritual night. There's natural darkness and there's spiritual darkness. So when God created the natural Day, the natural season, the natural things that would govern time that is known as Kronos, right? What is it that God wanted you and I to understand? What is it that God wanted you and I to understand when he created light? Come on, people. 
I've said it time and time again. Before God created what was natural, the spirit of what is natural existed before. So if there's a natural season that we cannot deny, people, there are those of you watching and listening from certain countries that you will not see what we're seeing in Canada. So we in Canada cannot deny, not only are the trees changing colors, and then certain days now you're going to have certain strong winds. If you notice, there are certain winds that show up in the fall that doesn't show up in summer. You wish you, wish you had those winds in the summer. But it doesn't show up in the summer. And you know one of the reasons why the wind show up in the fall the way it does? It blows off the leaves off the tree. The Bible talk about how oh, the trough is driven by the wind. <laughs> Not only the leaves changing, falling off the tree, the weather, the temperature changes. And even when it was summer, summer, you come inside here and you have your jacket and your scarf and stuff like that. Because it's one kind of weather that is inside here. <laughs> I want you to get this as we look at this. I'm not trying to show you natural stuff. When I talk to you about natural stuff, that's not where you're supposed to pitch tent. I want you to understand that there is something that is bigger than what is natural. Look at this. Go to Genesis chapter 8 with me. Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 to 22. Now in Genesis chapter 1, God purposed and put everything in order where it ought to be, what it ought to be where it ought to be, what it ought to be, and how it is meant to function to represent certain things about him. We know that after, based on what God is revealing to Moses, he created everything and put man and all of that, sin came into the picture. We get to chapter 6, and God says, <laughs> I, I, I am regretting this. Now, what we're reading there. It's for our sake. Because when God brought the flood, you would be asking the question, why did he do it? He told you, it grieved me that I have made man on the earth. Didn't he know that man was going to do that? So why would he say that? For your sake, for my sake. Right? So that you would understand why this happened. Now, in the midst of all of this coming to be, we know Noah came into the picture because of the ark that was being built, and God saved him and his family. Peter talked about it later on, where the flood was concerned, and it was, was a type of baptism. It was a type of baptism, an anti-type of baptism, the scripture says in Peter. When the flood ended, after 150 days, the water was up on the earth. The flood ended, chapter 8. Then God remembered Noah. The flood ended. Then God remembered Noah. All this being said here, because we know that God cannot forget. So why is this being said for you and I? God remember Noah and everything living, every living thing and all the animals that were with him Noah in the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped so the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters ceased, deceased. Then the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the mountain 
of Ararat. And the waters deceased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark and he made, watch this, and he Noah made, that he Noah made. Verse 7, then he sent, look, 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 look at the statement, then he Noah sent out, sent out a raven. I think it was last week Sunday I said that if man had not sinned and you need fish for dinner, you wouldn't need a hook and line and, and bait. Notice it said he sent out the raven. Because remember, to bring them in the ark in the first place, remember God commanded him to go and get what? Two by two. How did he do it? He went out and set a trap. He went out. And he spoke and gave instructions and directive and they followed him. He sent out, he now sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the water had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see, watch this now, he sent the dove to do what? To see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of his feet. And what did she do? She returned to the one who sent him. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her. And drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days. And again he sent the same dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening. And behold, a, watch this, a freshly plucked olive. Why not some other? There, there, there are things in here for you to understand, you know. <laughs> a freshly plucked olive leaf, my God Almighty, was in her mouth. And now uh, the dove represent what in the scripture? Olive represent what? Oil. The oil represent what? The anointing. <laughs> hey. A freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah, watch this. And when Noah saw it, he knew that the waters had receded. When you're able to hear the Holy Spirit, you will know things. He knew. He knew that the water had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove a third time. And watch this. And the dove did not return again to him anymore. The assignment is now complete. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month of the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God, then God spoke to Noah saying, I, I, I don't want. I'm not. I don't want to talk about this. But, but I noticed something, Marlon. After Noah finished build the ark, it was God who instructed him and told him when to go in, and told him exactly what to do. And now, even though he saw that the water dried up, he did not take it upon himself to come out. 
I don't know how many of you are hearing me because a lot of us in this room, we are so carnal. He waited on instructions. A lot of people, even people in Jamaica from the ministry in Jamaica, a lot of you, some of you left and gone now, God help you. They would criticize me. Because I don't know, I don't know people are telling me I have no vision. And listen, persons have come to me and asked me this question. Pastor, what is your vision for the ministry in the next five years? What do you think my answer is? Every pastor out there have a vision for the next five years or the next ten years. I have none. Because the church is not mine. Exactly. And you think that's, that's, that I'm worthless. You think that I'm not leading God's people. When you're leading God's people, you lead them according to the instructions and the directive that God gives you. Notice, God's people. God's people. Not your people. Watch this. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wife with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons, his wife and his wife's son, his son's wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. Why? Because God said so. Then, verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again Curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's mind, man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. This is what I want you to pay attention to. Verse 22. What God established in Genesis 1, 20, verse 14. Verse 22. He reassured Noah after the flood. He said in verse 22, are you looking at it? Read it with me. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and eat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not while the earth remains. While the earth remain. So why are we having fall? How many of you? How many of you in this room? Because a lot of you in here say you're born again. How many of you when the fall season came in, you even think about the word? You thought about God. You didn't just see it. Because there are those of us who... We love certain season of the year. We, we love it. We just love it. We do, we're not seeing, we're not seeing purpose. Every time I see a rainbow, do you think I think of gay? Do you think I think about two men and two women when I see a rainbow? I think about God. I think about his faithfulness. I think about that he cannot lie. And it does something for my faith. That while a present situation is going on, I'm not even giving it the time of my day. Because I know that God cannot lie. Because the rainbow is reminding me of his faithfulness. Some of us don't because we don't believe the Bible. Every season that I see comes in, 
I'm reminding about, I'm, I'm reminding of something about God, something about his word, something about his truth, something about his faithfulness. While the earth remains, seed time, seed time is which season? Harvest, harvest is which season? Fall, cold, which season? <laughs> the long one, right? Winter. Eat is which season. And then he went on like he's emphasizing on it. And then he spelled it out. He said, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. So Abe, we know that Noah lived many years after this. But Noah died knowing that even after he died, this would continue to be. This would continue to be. Watch this. If God is saying that while the earth remain, there will be seed time and harvest, cold and eat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. And as I said before, I want you to stay with me. The natural is meant to represent what is spirit. And what is spirit was first. Was first. If God is saying that the season would continue while the earth remain, what would happen in the spirit? If you notice, if you notice, it talks about days and years. In between here, we know that days make up weeks, weeks makes up months, months make up years. All of this is affected. That's how we, how do we measure a day? There are 24 hours. We measure a week by seven days, right? We measure a month by, it's still four, four weeks? Four weeks in a month, right? In some, uh, four weeks, right? And we measure a year by, Twelve months, but the twelve months is calculated in three hundred and sixty five days within the year. And there are some here that have three hundred and sixty six, right? Don't worry with that one. <laughs> All of this has to do with natural time. What governs a day? What governs a week? What governs a month? And what governs a year? It's time, yes. But there is something that governs that time. No. Every year is governed by season. And notice, to show you how it governs the year, it divides the year into four parts. It, not the year. Not the year dividing the season. The seasons dividing the year. So in each year we have what? We have four seasons. 
And time is affected by the seasons. Because notice, let me show you. Some of you, 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 you we're past our talk about. Today, Saturday, the 21st of October, 2023. We're in the year 2023. Right? The day started 12 a.m. So now, what time is it? 12 noon. So we need to stop. What season is this day in? Fall. When did fall start? The 23rd of September. Right? So we are almost in the first month of the season that is called fall. But if you notice, how it plays out is day by day. So when this day ends today, the 21st of, September, of October ends today, and this day, Saturday ends, we are going into Sunday, and we're going, watch this, we're going further and further into fall, and then we come to the end of fall by being playing out by days, weeks, and how many months hosts the season called fall? Three months. And when and, and if you if you're not even paying attention to it, nature is responding accordingly. Because when the fall finish, winter comes in. Thank you. Thank you very much. It doesn't matter what you may choose to call it or whatever. The seasons remain consistent. It's because God says as long as the earth remains, this is what's going to govern. How things will unfold. Now, as I said, I don't want you to stuck with the natural. All of this is playing out around us, and the natural man is only seeing fall. The natural man is only seeing winter. The natural man is only seeing spring. The natural man is only seeing summer. How should the church? How should the church? Sister Joy, how should the church operate? Which of the seasons should our life be governed by? We don't think about it. Do you know that your growth in Christ is governed by seasons? Your walk in Christ is governed by seasons. <laughs> and Marlon, when he, when he said the harvest is ripe and ready to be harvested, what harvest was he talking about? He, they knew of the natural. He said, look, look at the fields. It's white and ready to be harvested, naturally. But when he said the harvest is ready to be harvested, was he talking about pumpkin was he talking about melons and apples and whatever he was talking about man he says pray the lord of the harvest and he will send reapers into his harvest you and i at some point was a part of that harvest and god sent an harvester to cross path with you and now you are in if you're born again, you are in. After you have been harvested and you come in, how does your life continue? How does your life continue after you have been harvested? Naturally, when something is harvested, what do we harvest it for? What do we do with it? You harvest it to serve your purpose. 
So if you harvest tomatoes, what does it, what, what are you harvesting the tomatoes to do? To serve your purpose. You can use it to do all kind of stuff. I don't like it. Yuck. Baby tomatoes, yuck. It's good for me? No, yuck. <laughs> whatever, to me, whatever tomato is give to you, I have to find some other way of getting it to eat it? Oh. But it... It is there for a purpose, right? Now look at this. And I think I'll stop here and I'll pick up in the next fasting meeting and do part two of this. I want you to go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'm only looking at one verse. I want us as God's people to function completely different from the natural world around you. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 1. Verse 1. Anybody getting anything out of this so far? I hope you, you are. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. I want you to all read this verse with me. Ready? Read. To everything there is a? Hold on. You did not read what you just read a while ago. So you need to read it again. To make sure that you read what you read. Right? Read it again. To everything there is what? What did I say earlier on before I read it? That your growth in Christ is governed by? Seasons. seasons. Your walk with God is governed by seasons. It's, measure, it's measured by seasons. Listen. Read it again. To everything there is a? And a time for every purpose under heaven. Period. One verse of reading. <laughs> Did you see that? To everything. Trisha, Brother Patrick, can I interrupt your corner? Even persecution, it happens within. A season. And, and what you need to keep in mind, as we know, each year, each year is divided and governed by four seasons, right? And the four seasons is three months. Three months. When fall comes to the climax of the three months. It no nature no. It gives up and winter comes in. Fall doesn't last forever. Winter doesn't last forever. Spring doesn't last forever and summer doesn't last forever. We need to understand the seasons so that we can experience the benefits of what each season brings. To us. And you also need to know when the season changes so that you make the necessary shift, transition. Because if the season is over and you stay in it, there is no grace. There is no grace. There is no anointing. The spirit leave. Anytime the season change, the spirit move to be in the present season. That's why we need to know. And I'm going to show you that Jesus said we need to know. Fall is a time of harvest. So this is not the time where you go out and sow certain seed and you're doing certain things you don't 
there is a particular season that is established to facilitate seed time. So you need to know when to sow. Then you need to know when to reap. <laughs> no, 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 it's the season. I'm telling you, it's the season that determines the fruit. The season governs. Likewise in the spirit, the season governs. Watch this. This is the last scripture I'll show you and stop for today, as I said. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So after we see, it is clearly established in Ecclesiastes, observation. There is no promise in Ecclesiastes. There is no promise in Proverbs. They are all observation. Proverbs is godly observation, spiritual observation. Ecclesiastes, it's man, watch this, if you remember, under the sun. So Solomon is observing everything from a natural standpoint. Then he says that let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The whole duty of a man is to fear God and keep his commandment. He observe how people accumulate wealth and how their journey end. He said it's vanity, vanity, it's emptiness, and it's vexation of spirit. That you come in this life and think that your purpose is to accumulate wealth, and then you're going to leave. He says, you're going to die and you don't even know who is going to inherit after your work so hard. The king-sized bed and all that jacuzzi that you die and the big dirty foot cousin where you never like. <laughs> Go spread off in <laughs> your bed because you're dead. He said, if you think that's what life is about, it's vanity, it's emptiness, and it's vexation of spirit. There's a season to everything and a time for every purpose under heaven. The last scripture for now, as I said, First Chronicles. I said Corinthians? Yes. That's a mistake. It's supposed to be Chronicles. Sorry. First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12. Trisha is in a season right now in the spirit. I don't know if she know it, but there is. Sister Pat, you're in a season right now. I don't know if you know it, but you are. As you are in the natural, so you are in the spirit. The question is, what season is it? Like each time of each day, each, within each hour of the day, there's a, there's, a, there's a particular moment where we find ourselves wanting to know what time is it? Because there are things that you have to do. And there are certain things in, within certain days, you have appointments that you have to meet. So you are more conscious. There are certain days where you're more conscious of paying attention to the time than you are certain other days. There are those moments in our life in Christ where a certain shift takes place. People around you can never get it. They can never understand it because if they're not in the spirit, they'll never know. It doesn't matter how much you even explain it. Even if you write it out and spell it out for them, they will never get it. But you just know that a shift take place. There's time, Sister Carter, you can't explain it. You can't even write it, but you just know that you know that something has shifted and it's like, I cannot continue as I were last week. A month ago, a year ago. I have watched in this ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about from even way back. But this ministry in Canada. And when I said this ministry, I'm talking about my life being a part of such. Bobby Somers is the face of the ministry until God said otherwise. So if you put Bobby Somers out... You're putting the ministry out. 
And you should be, you should be grateful to God when God sent a man of God, sent an Elijah, sent a Moses, sent a Joshua, and you have the opportunity to be aside alongside to help because your labor is not in vain, and God will not overlook what you have done to contribute. I have seen seasons after season, and I have made the announcement each time the season show up. But the question is, how many of us are able to hear? Let me show you something. In First Chronicles chapter 12, do you want me to? It's very dangerous. You sure you still want to go there with me? <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> so might as well we, <laughs> we, we can't even go back to land now. So <laughs> we, we, we either drown or swim. Now watch this. And we're not going to drown, right? This is the water of life. Now in verse 23, I'm going to read just one verse up here and then I'm going to go down to verse 31 and 32. And I want you to see why verse 31 and 32 came into the mix because of what he said in verse 23. What is happening here in the backstory of what's going on here is that Saul was the first king of Israel. He died and David, as we know, was the king that God chose. Verse 23 says, now these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war and came to David at Ebron. Because that was where David was first anointed king. They came to David at Ebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him. And, and why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? According to the word of the Lord. Why is Bobby Somers in this position? Did Bobby Somers take this upon himself? <laughs> so those of you who have fight, be very careful. I'm going to continue to warn inside and outside. Because there are people that are watching to find accusation, to affect, to stop the ministry from going forward as it should. God help them. I have to warn them to because I love them and I would love to see them come to know Christ. They came to David to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. And then it lists the tribes, Judah and Simeon and Levi and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh and so on. I don't want to go through all of that. So come down to verse 31. So you know what is happening here when we read verse 31 and 32. It says in verse 31, of the tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, and watch this, who were designated by name to come and make... David, king. Verse 32. Of the sons of Issachar, who had, who had understanding of what? To do what? To know what Israel ought to. Their chief were 200 and of their brethren, and their brethren, all their brethren were at their so this particular tribe, you notice what God gave them the ability to do? To understand. Because if you're going to do whatever you do, it is governed by a season. It is measured by a season. And you need to know what the season is. They came to David and David knew what their role is. So when they needed to know what time it is, who did they consult? 
the sons of Issachar. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did you hear what you said? When God allowed me to make the announcement, the announcement brings you in awareness. And once you hear it and believe it, immediately you've shifted. It doesn't happen by feelings. It happened by hearing and believing. Let me say this, and as I said, I stop. Where that was concerned, where that is concerned, if you notice, with David becoming the next king over Israel, David, we know, was completely different from Saul. Saul did not care about this particular tribe, giving an understanding of the times. But David, he needed that. Because David is going to be the prototype of Christ. That even today, Christ is known as the son of David. Now, what we see play out before we were introduced to this particular tribe, having the ability to understand the times. So that Israel would know what they ought. Not, not, not what they can do. Because what you can do is different from what you ought to do. What you can do is governed by Kronos. What you ought to do is governed by Kairos. How would they know what season it is for them to shift into it? God would send them prophets. God would send them prophets. God would send them prophets. When the Holy Spirit came, he came in a season. Even in the natural, God actually sent the Holy Spirit and the feast of what? Pentecost. When Pentecost? What, what, what season? What is the natural season that Pentecost fall under? What is the natural season that Passover fall under? Passover is a spring festival. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Pentecost take place between, watch this, between the ending of spring and the beginning of summer. I'm going to say this to you today. That we will never be able to make any pre-announcement about a specific, watch this, day and hour in which Christ would come. We will know. Hear me and hear me good today. We will know the day that Jesus will come. We will know the day. No one knew the day to go into the ark. He didn't just go in. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. And he also knew when to come out. So why do you think that we won't? Watch this. But what you will understand, there is going to be a natural season as well as there will be a spiritual season that will tell us the season in which Christ is coming. You remember when Jesus was talking about his return? He said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, he says, watch this, look at the fig tree. He said, look at the fig tree. He says, when it buds, 
and it's shooting forth and putting forth forth. You know it's what? You know that summer is near. The natural season is not just there for us to be stuck in the natural. It, it's speaking to us about spiritual things. I'm going to stop. I wish I could just stay there and just continue it and finish it, but I'm going to stop. And I'll do part two in the next fasting meeting, which will be in um, November. Times and seasons in God. What season? The church corporately is within a season. And within that corporate season, as individuals, we are also within a season that is, watch this, that is combining with the corporate season. Nothing happens in your life without it being governed by a season. And every season comes to an end and transitioned into another season. You know that even when fall started, the first day of fall was not a full day. It started a particular time. Five something on the day, on the 23rd of September, five something p.m., you know, fall started. So, the, watch this. Summer transits. Watch this, you know. Summer exit five something p.m., and fall started. That if you don't look carefully, but which one are you even see it? Did you saw it? So likewise, Jesus says, as the wind blows, look out there. You, you see the wind? No, you don't. You saw the effects. You're seeing the effects. That wind that is blowing right now, you know where it's going to end? Do you know where it came from? It did not start there. The wind did not start there. And he says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You, you hear the sound of it coming, and you watch this, but you can't tell where it came from, and you cannot tell where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So when the season shifts, you never recognize it at the beginning. But when you're able to hear the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will allow you to be aware that a shift has taken place and what it is, what it looks like, and you're able to reap the harvest of it. God bless you. Your season has changed. And for some of you in this room right now, your season has changed. You didn't feel it. You didn't even saw it. But if you hear, if you heard what the Spirit is saying, you would know. Because your season changed spiritually, not by what you can see or what you can feel, but what you're able to hear. He who has an ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying right now. And he said, today is the day of salvation. If you should hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you hear God right now, you will understand that your season has changed. Because when you're even in a situation, circumstances, the more moment God speak to you hmm? signs accompany it also but if you notice signs accompany the word God is going to speak first God is going to speak first the sign validates what he said 
sign validates what is said. <laughs> Father, thank you. Seasons have been changed. And because of what has been changed, it is going to manifest itself in certain areas of your life and in certain things as an indicator. As an indicator. That's not when the season changed, but that is going to be an indicator for you to further know. That this has happened. This has come to pass. And you need to give yourself. You need to open yourself more. You need to embrace it. Because that is what is. That is what is. That is what is. That is what is. And with the changing of the seasons comes another level of anointing. With the changing of the season comes another level of anointing. And that anointing is meant to support the season being played out in your life and whatever God meant to accomplish. The yoke shall be destroyed and the burden shall be removed from your shoulders because of the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me. He has anointed me because of the season that has entered in. And remember, one of the things that Jesus said when he made that announcement, he said that he has anointed me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the acceptable season of the Lord. Father, I thank you that there is a divine shift. I thank you that there is a divine shift. I thank you that there is a divine shift. The word has been released. Somebody heard it. And Father, the word being heard and received and believed allowed us to be attired properly for the change of the season. For the change of the season. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody lift your hands if you can, please. And you lift your hands as a sign of you receiving the change of your season. I will not say anything specific to you unless the Spirit say, but what I want you to know is that your season has changed. And how do I know that? By the word, by the word being announced. He has anointed me to proclaim the year of liberty. The year of liberty. Yeah. There are seasons in Christ. There are seasons in the spirit. There are seasons in the anointing. And refuse to be stuck. Refuse to remain in a past season. That God is no longer there. The spirit is no longer there. The anointing is no longer there. Move with the flow. Mama, no moko sheke sata. Riboko sheke sata yaba. You see, it's the plan of the enemy for you to stay in a season that God has moved from. And you feel comfortable that, yes, I was in a season. No! No, 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 no. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. You need to move with the flow. You need to move with the change of the seasons. So as you lift your hands, 
you're also saying, God, I'm giving you permission to take me into the next season. I'm giving you permission to allow me to be aware of the season that I am in, that I can receive what harvest, what spiritual harvest that would even spill over into what is natural. Because it's the spirit that is meant to affect the natural, not the natural affecting the spirit. So as you understand the spiritual season and what is happening, you will see things spilling out that is affecting the natural, that is affecting your natural surrounding, that is affecting your natural environment. So there are certain seasons that will change, that your financial situation, it's going to be affected by it, that there's going to be a divine shift, that you're no longer struggling. And it's not that which should allow you to know, but it's what is flowing from the Spirit. You understand that this is why this is happening. So today, Father, thank you for your people in this room. Thank you for your people that are watching. Somebody in their living room, somebody in their kitchen, somebody in the car, somebody somewhere. There's a divine shift that has taken. A, a, a new wind is blowing. There's a particular wind that blows during the summer. There's a particular wind that blows during the fall. Do you know that there is wind? There's a wind that blows during the winter time? Huh? There, do you realize that even in the winter there is wind that is blowing. We see blowing snow. We see blowing stuff happening because there is wind. There is wind in every season. And right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I release you into the wind of the Holy Spirit. I release you to the wind of the Holy Spirit to shift you, to blow out. And when the wind blows, there is two things happening. It is blowing out and it's blowing in. It is blowing out and it's blowing in. So certain things cannot continue to be because the wind is blowing out and it is blowing in. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day. And I thank you, Lord, for the times and the seasons that you have kept in your authority. And in the moment that the church needs to come into it, the Holy Spirit will make it known. The Holy Spirit will make it known unto us. Father, thank you. And if you sense, if you sense that there is such a shift, then by all means, to get further understanding, ask the Holy Spirit to make it clear. And believe, believe to hear from him. Believe to hear from him. And based on where you are, he knows exactly how to speak to you. Anticipate him speaking. Look for him speaking. He may speak to you in dream. He may speak to you in a vision. He may even speak to us in an audible voice because he's still capable of doing that. But then there will be impressions in your spirit, promptings, nudges, if you may. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Father, I thank you for the season that this ministry has been ushered into. I thank you for what you have done in bringing us to this stage. And when many think that we have failed, when many think that we have lost anything, they are making the biggest mistake that they have ever made in their life. Because Father, once we continue to hear your directives and your instructions, that's what matters. And so, Lord, I thank you for the people 
that you have positioned even for this season. That with the changing of the seasons, there are some that you have sifted out. You have sifted out. You have moved. You have exposed. And you will continue to sift until those who are meant to be a part of even this present season that the ministry I've now ushered into will remain. Father, I give you permission to sift because the ministry belongs not to Bobby Somers, but to the living God, to the living God. So it's your, it's your business. As Jesus says, I'm here to do my father's business. So Father, we continue to do business until he return. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that as we enter into the season, it's going to affect our health. It's going to affect our finances. It's going to affect our family. It's going to affect our marriage. It's going to affect our mindset. It's going to affect our body. It's going to affect everything concerning our life as we give ourselves to it. So, Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. And I thank you for times and seasons that are within you. May we continue to be aware of such and have that understanding because it's important in order for us to be effective, in order for us to honor you, in order for us to glorify you. So let it be. So let it be. Amen. 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 Bless you. Yesterday.